Should we all hold up? Right. Good I, afternoon, I everybody. <laughs> Wait, I'm supposed to be mirrored. Oh, shoot. Do that. Okay, and we're live. Normally be, it's fine. Sorry. Hey, I'm Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we have a, a real special event for you today. And lively uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> An unruly crowd here. Uh, we're celebrating Lauren, the publication of Lauren Willig's new book, Band of Sisters, and she's brought her own posse, uh, Team W, uh, Beatrice Williams and Karen White, you know, frequent good friends of hers and frequent collaborators to give her the third degree about this new book. Mm -hmm. And Barbara's holding it up there in her home <laughs> office. And um, those of you who are watching on Facebook, if you have, if you have questions for Lauren, uh, Beatrice, Karen, or Barbara, Put it, send them in the comments field, and I will, I will appear like Caliban. That's the wrong character. Uh, I like Caliban though. Uh, I will appear magically towards the end of the the presentation and ask some of your questions. Okay. So also, we just received signed copies of Band of Sisters, uh, just I think yesterday or Thursday. So I will be putting that information in the field as well. So anyway, Barbara, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. I'm holding up the books so you can all admire the cover, but also, and Patrick did as my reminder to tell you that we do have autographed copies of this wonderful book. And um, if you're a fan of Lawrence, as I assume you are, if you're watching this, uh, unless a Beatrice Williams fans just snuck in or a Karen White fan just <laughs> snuck in. Anyway, you will probably want to have one of these. Um, I wanted to say, Lauren, that there is like an entire now genre of World War II books with um, women in the lead, World War II stories. Um, and so it was, a, it was a treat to actually go to World War I, which is not my favorite war. But <laughs> on the other hand, um, I was delighted to be able to think about the Smith College women and how brave and adventurous they were at a time when women were not necessarily encouraged to behave like this um, and how they felt that they should go to France and um, and help with the war effort. So bravo for you. Now, you and I first became acquainted when you were writing the Pink Carnation series, which I truly love because I am a hopeless Regency fan. Um, and and that was wonderful. And, and you brought it to a conclusion that I thought worked really well, although it made me sad that, that so far there haven't been any more stories about that. And then Thank you've written a number of other um, books looking into history, sometimes mostly two track stories. Um, but in this one, well, you tell us about a sure book. Why don't you give us a little well, that's true. I mean, this summation is of this wonderful book and we'll go from there. Okay, well, this book is very different from my other books in a lot of ways. This book is a single timeline story. It's based on the true story of the Smith College Relief Unit, who were a group of enterprising Smith College alumni who went overseas during World War I to bring humanitarian aid to French villagers right behind the front lines. And this book is different. It's a single timeline and it is very, very closely based on real events in a way that none of my other books have been before. Usually what I do is I'm like a little historical magpie. I steal shiny bits from lots of different real people and I paste their things together into my own pastiche to create my fictional characters and fictional scenarios. But with this book, I stumbled on, actually, I mean, you mentioned the Pink series. And part of the way the Pink series grew was I had this daydream of at the time I was a grad student and I was having a really hard time piecing together the archival material I needed for my dissertation. I had this daydream about a grad student who would stumble upon a treasure trove of letters. And at the time I didn't. This time I actually stumbled on that treasure trove of letters because the Smith College Relief Unit, the real women of the Smith College Relief Unit, they were all letter writers. They wrote home reams of letters from the psalm while writing at the ends of their letters. We're tired, we're exhausted, it's cold. Please don't expect us to write letters. And then they'd write another 20 pages. And their letters were fabulous. They were personal. They were full of these, the details that authors long for, what mm -hmm. they were doing, what they were eating, what they were seeing, what they were feeling, the snarky comments they made to each other and the snarky comments they overheard. Actually, one of my favorite snarky comments I managed to get into the book was so, you know, people were kind of skeptical about the idea of a group of American college women going off to the front lines. And one of the things they overheard someone say, they heard, they heard um, one soldier say to another, wow, they sent a troop from Smith? I wish they'd send one from Radcliffe. And his friend turns to him and goes, no, I wish they'd send one from Gimbel's. 
as any New Yorkers remember, Gimbel's was a department store um, that lasted through my youth. But anyway, like people, people thought they were, this was kind of a hilarious concept, American women in the psalm. And in their letters, you read all about the ways they blunder through all these difficulties and the skepticism and the way they overcome that skepticism until they become in fact real heroines. And the French government begs the Brits not to send them away when the Brits take over that part of the war zone. So anyway, this book, I mean, it's drawn from the archival record in ways that none of my books ever have been before. And I am so indebted to those Smithies who went to the Somme, both for their brave work and for writing home all sorts of things they shouldn't have been writing. And may, may I interject something here on the subject of the letters? So Lauren, what, what book were you researching when you accidentally stumbled <laughs> upon the whole idea, the whole Smith unit story, which you were not familiar with, I believe at the time? Well, you see, I sometimes co-write with these two other writers. I mean, they're really tough people, but I suck up, I deal with it. I think their names are Beatrice and Karen. And, you know, at the time we were working on a book set in three very quiet, uneventful periods of French history, World War I, World War II, and the 1960s. And for the World War I period of that book, which you might have heard of, it's this little thing called All the Ways We Said Goodbye. Um, we needed to know what Christmas would have been like in occupied France during World War I. And so there we were desperately searching for Christmas customs in Picardy in World War I, and up popped a memoir by a Smith College alumna talking about throwing Christmas parties for French villagers right behind the front lines in 1917. And of course, this was not the sort of detail we were looking for at all, but I was completely struck by the incongruity of it. You know, mm -hmm. what were these Smithies doing? They're dressed up like Father Christmas. I kid you not, they were dressed up like Father Christmas. And it just like, at first I thought it had to be fiction. And of course, you know, I dropped everything. I read the memoir and I was so intrigued that I went hunting to see if I could find more. And that led me to fragments of their letters that had been published in the Smith Alumni Quarterly in 1917 and 1918. Because, and this is something that absolutely cracks me up, people would send these long personal letters home and their families would send them to the alumni mag, which would then cut out the good bits and publish them basically in real time. And then in the next round of letters home from the front, you would see people writing, what on earth were you thinking? That was a private letter. I sent it to you. Who said you could share it? If I see any more of my letters to you in the alumni mag, I'm not writing to you anymore. But it anyway, it's not like social media to me. You know, it's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, it's, you it's were like supposed to tag me. Email. I know. Mm. But that's so exactly me. what it was. Mm -hmm. I grew up north of Chicago in a suburb called Winnetka. And the there was a weekly paper published called the Winnetka Talk. And that's that's what they published. You know, all, I mean, it was like it was it was really better than social media. It was amazing. You know, you had articles and you know letters and reviews, and I mean, it was like a, I wouldn't say it was a gospel, right? but but um, well, I mean, why come up with your own material when you can just repost you know material from others? Not that <laughs> not that any of us that, could that do anything like that with the repost. Well, button. you know, one of the key differences was that you had to put your real name into it. And mm -hmm. I think that it made it much less venomous and far more responsible because, you know, it was perfectly clear. And, and that would be true of the letters, Lauren, that, you know, they were signed by people, you know, people had to take responsibility for what they wrote. Um, and I think it led to a much more civilized discourse than, mm -hmm. you know, than we find today. I also wanted to mention, um, I'm going to hold the book sideways because <laughs> It's easily the longest book you have ever written. Um, did the letters inspire you for, I mean, we're we're getting close to 500 pages, at least in the reading. Well, to be fair, I, I, it's true. I have always written long and I've always had to cut down. I had a couple of pink books that came in at around 140,000 words. Um, and some of them I cut and some of them I didn't. But yeah, this is definitely the longest of my, my already pretty long books. And the problem was there was just so much material there that the real things the Smithies encountered and they went through were so fabulous. And you know, if I tried to cram it all in, this book could have been easily three times the length. Their run-ins with livestock alone could have taken up 500 pages. So in this case, I feel like I really, I almost feel like I cheated because I coasted on their real life and their real accounts of things. All the material was right there for me. All I had to do was 
build my imaginary characters and put them into the place of the real women and figure out their emotional lives and how they're responding to the situation. But all of the other things I would usually agonize about, like what happens next? Or how do I do this plot twist or whatever? They did it for me. It's incredible. It's like, it really is history that reads more like fiction. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, changed the names and, you know, put the words down and added dialogue. Right. Well, you, you did a great you're job. Totally envious, right? <laughs> yeah. If I can only find letters like that. Um, another thing that I, I, cause it, I, I love thick books, you know, I, you remember the eighties and all the big family sagas. We've talked about that many yes. times. Um, I, I, I mean, I just love stories that, you know, with multiple characters and just drama. And of course you put the Lauren Willick humor in there, which I love. I mean, the conversations between these women and the little, you know, um, one-liners or, I mean, some of it's, I mean, there's, this is serious stuff going on, but there's some really good one-liners that I'm just, you know, crying laughing over, but I had a serious question here. So as Beatrice and, and I know, since we're your chauffeurs, when we're on tour, we know that you do not drive, but a big part of this book is obviously the transportation and you know only a few of the women did drive one of them learned how to drive um but most fascinating of all was that the one of the trucks came in pieces and they had to put it together so <laughs> what on god's earth did you use to research that because you didn't have anything of your own experience to go from i was just i was amazed I had the exact same question because I am <laughs> reading this story. Well. Come on, Lauren, I know you don't drive. I remember, I mean, I, I've written in the First World War before and I had to write about the Ford Model T, which by the way, doesn't even drive. I mean, it, it's completely different to a normal car that we would drive today in terms of the gears and everything. So I, and I, I had to watch YouTube videos to figure this <laughs> out. I mean, and I, you know, I drive pretty extensively. So Lauren, tell me about your car research since one of your main characters is a chauffeur well, besides watching what uh, us drive last book tour what what else did you do? <laughs> yeah my job is fetching the coffee while karen and beatrice take turns driving and i also do social media so i'm not entirely useless while i'm being <laughs> chauffeured um but so backing up a bit for people who haven't read the books, the Smith unit had three trucks that they brought with them from America. And these were crucial to their plan because they needed them first to drive down from Paris to their headquarters right behind the front lines. And then they had 11 villages to start that they were meant to rebuild from scratch basically and take care of the villagers, offer them medical care, social service work, classes for the children. And they needed to be able to get from village to village in the mud of the Somme. And so their trucks were crucial. And they had a bunch of girls who were the chauffeurs who were the ones who knew how to drive and had to pass a driver's test in Paris, which they did by the skin of their teeth, according to their letters. One claim she only passed because the person ahead of her knocked over a whole cart of vegetables. And so the driving the instructor was so traumatized. He was just like, by the time she came around, he's like, you did not knock over a car, do you pass? Anyway, <laughs> so, but um, I think in this case that the not knowing how to drive may have actually been a benefit for me because I was able to go to the same YouTube videos that Beatrice was talking about, but with no preconception of how a car works because I've been behind the wheel of a car <laughs> once in my life and it did not end well for anyone or the car. So, and actually my most recent learner's permit expired like 10 years ago. So I was able to watch those videos and none of this, I didn't have to unlearn anything. And I also, again, had these unbelievably detailed letters that the women were writing home. And because the trucks were such a big part of their existence, I had their descriptions of what it was like to fight with, they called them the machines, what it was like to fight with the machines in the mud. And also, as Karen was saying, part of their issue was when they first get there, their trucks are supposed to be delivered to Paris so they can leave for the front, and they aren't. And they wait and they wait and they wait. And finally, um, their director is like, you know what, we're going to the trucks. And they find them in crates on the docks of San Nazar and they're in pieces. And the women are like, what do we do? It's like they're an like, Ikea flat pack situation. It's exactly <laughs> like an Ikea flat pack situation. And their director is like, you're smart women. You went to Smith, here's a wrench, figure it out. <laughs> And they do, they get those trucks together and they get them moving, which is just really incredible. Yeah. Um, but 
they wrote about what they had to do to get them moving. And so I was able to piggyback directly on their experience and their relation of their experience um, with absolutely no driving experience of my own. Wow, very impressive. Because if I didn't know, I would believe that you knew exactly what you were talking about. Well, the thing is, if you want me to drive your, you know, your so, white yeah, company, say, your white company truck from nineteen. That was my next question, Lauren. If I we get a board for the next right. tour, can you That's drive us around? I would think I would be able to drive the Model T, but do not expect me anywhere near the wheel of your Volvo B. Okay. <laughs> that was a big mistake. So I read a long time ago, and I think it's true that one of the biggest, the best way, perhaps, or certainly a way, to write about a big event like a war is to focus on a singular person or, you know, um, and so in this book, we've talked about the large scale thing. We have a lot of Swift women and Smith women and we're in a big war in France, but you have to have um, a character who's going to pull us through there. So tell us a little bit about your scholarship girl, Kate Moran, and why she's motivated or why she goes along with this trip and what particular hazards are involved for her. So one of the things that really fascinated me when I stumbled on the Smith unit was what makes American women decide to leave a comfortable home and go overseas in the middle of a war to live in unimaginable conditions to help people they've never met. Um, because most of these women were upper middle class women from comfortable backgrounds. You know, why go over to a war zone? But Kate, my scholarship girl, she's the exception. So if anyone else loved a tree grows in Brooklyn growing up, Kate, my, my heroine, she's basically Francie Nolan. She okay. grew up poor in Brooklyn with an, but I swapped the father mother thing. She grows up with an Irish American mother and a Czech father who is right off the boat. He drives a cart for, for a brewery and is kicked in the head by the cart horse and dies when she's very, very young. And they're, they really live in abject poverty until her mother, like the mother in a tree grows in Brooklyn, marries a nice policeman and has, you know, enters a time of prosperity with many little brothers for Kate, but Kate is the odd one out. And she lives in the library and wins a scholarship to Smith where she winds up rooming with the daughter of an eccentric socialite suffragette descended from every Knickerbocker patroon you can imagine. The sort of people who look upon the Mayflower as a Johnny come lately kind of ship, but mm -hmm. they, they, they bond at Smith. But Kate, after graduation, um, she doesn't fit in with this crowd of wealthy upper middle class women, but she also doesn't fit in at home anymore because they view her as sort of above them and whatnot. And so she takes a job as a French teacher, which she hates like fire. And so when her old college roommate, Emmy Van Alden comes and tells her that a girl dropped out at the last minute from the newly formed Smith College Relief Unit and they need someone who can drive and speak French and would Kate take her place? Ordinarily, Kate would never have touched this with a 10 foot pole, but she's miserable. And this is, or at least as Emmy describes it to her, an all expensive paid trip to France where she'll never otherwise get to go. That, you know, Emmy tells her the alumni are funding it. You know, they've raised prodigious sums of money for the unit from alumni and that her expenses will be paid. And so in a fit of the doldrums, hating her job, hating her life, she agrees to go and, and immediately regrets it the second she's on that boat to France. Because I wanted to, have someone who wasn't gung-ho and who was in the group but felt like she didn't belong to the group. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to watch how that person then grows and adjusts over the course of the novel and really becomes part of this band of sisters. Mm -hmm. um, she was also inspired by a, a bunch of things I read, even though, so my two heroines, Kate and Emmy, are totally fictional. I made them up out of whole cloth unlike some of the rest of the unit who are thinly fictionalized versions of some of the real people in some cases. But Kate was inspired by, when I was reading that initial memoir I stumbled on, there was one member of the unit, the real unit who was Catholic. And in the memoir, when the memoir writer refers to her, there is a difference in tone. Um, when she ta they talk about, they throw a mass for the villagers not long after they get there. And the writer of the memoir talks about how, you know, Maud, Maud Kelly was, was the name of the, I mean, the real life Catholic member of the unit, how, you know, she knew how to do this stuff because she was one of those people. Mm -hmm. And then once I read the private letters, there was even in a couple of them, there was really strong anti-Catholic sentiment, which is I think something now from the remove of a century, we forget just how strong 
that kind of anti-Catholicism was in the US that, and also anti-Irish sentiment. This is the era of Irish need not apply. Mm -hmm. And so it felt very natural to me to make my heroine that fish out of water, the one Catholic girl at Smith, Irish American, where she looks like the rest of the Smithies, she sounds like the rest of the Smithies, but she knows that the second anyone knows where she comes from and what she is, they will suddenly look at her differently. And what does that do to you? And what does that do to you on a mission like this where you know, you're all down to the wire and you have to work together. So that's where Kate came from. And, the, and, I, and I noticed that there were two of um, two later come, uh, we don't really get to meet them very well because they, they joined the unit very late, but they seemed oddly familiar to me. Yeah. I was just wondering where they came from. So in real life um, and in my book, the Smith unit were signed up for six month contracts because their founder was very canny. She knew that some of the women, once they got there, were gonna take one look at their headquarters and be like, okay, bye, done with this, going home now. But by signing them up to six month contracts, you know, she made sure that people actually stayed. Although two people left almost right away. One girl had a real nervous breakdown and another, her mother died and she had to leave. Um, but the rest, they had to stay whether they liked it or not. Um, but at the end of six months, a bunch of people did leave the unit. And but by that time, this is in early 1918, the unit had become a media sensation. You would never know it now because no one's ever heard of them, but they were a thing. Reporters trekked to their headquarters in the mud and they were overwhelmed with applications from people who wanted to be the new members of the Smith College Relief Unit. And so when members left, they, they brought in new members to replace them. But there was a big problem. The Brits had taken over their part of the war zone and the Brits did not believe in women in the war zone, which the Smithies thought was ridiculous. Anyway, but so the, the Brits couldn't get rid of the Smith unit. The French government loved them. Everyone loved them. They like the Brits were bombarded with petitions not to make the Smithies leave. And they actually wound up evicting all the other women in the war zone except for the Smithies, which was really funny because, and the Smithies wrote home being like, we're the only women left, you know, there's one nurse in such and such a place and then it's us. But um, the problem was they wouldn't issue passes for the new members to join. So the new members, there were new members of the Smith unit who were there, but they were stranded in Paris and couldn't join the unit until later. And funnily enough, two of those members in my book mm -hmm. happened to be named Williams and White. And one really likes wine, and one really dislikes the cold. Wow. And Wait, I thought there was a real Karen. What about me? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So it really is Easter eggs for your readers. So Beatrice, you've written about um, women in this time period. And it seems to me, you know, the early 20th century was the time when women were engaged in a lot of revolutionary causes. I mean, we had the whole suffragette movement going on. You know, we had the temperance movement going on. We had women uniting um, in a sisterhood kind of a thing that was really interesting. So did you run across this, this um, Smith College thing or is Lauren the only one who opened the treasure well, trunk? You know, until we came to, uh, to research uh, all the ways we said goodbye, I hadn't heard of it, but you know, I, I had come across just so many instances of, of, of exactly what you're saying. I think this was a time period, uh, you know, from really, I think the start, even you know, the, really the end of the 19th century going into the 20th century, when women really are starting to find their voice, when we're, we're that sort of, I think that fantasy echo was really a turning point where you have a lot of women, suddenly they're you know, it's not easy to go to college and it's not easy to found your own career, but all of a sudden women are able to do it if they're willing to fight for it. It's not like the door is completely closed. Mm -hmm. If you fight for it, you can get it. And, and so women who are really tenacious and really want to do these things are able to kind of fight their way to the front. You know, there are so many, uh, and, and, and I think World War I was terrific. It was a proving ground, you know, even though the British weren't allowing women in, in the war zone, you know, obviously they had to, you know, with so many men on the front, women are filling all these roles. They're doing really difficult work as nurses, as drivers, all kinds of things. Uh, and, and, and suddenly it's, it's like a proving ground. And my, you know, I'm always sort of guided by this, 
amazing grandmother. She's uh, no longer with us, but she was born in 1916 in Kobe, Japan, and sort of worked her way around the British Empire before finally ended up raising her children in post-war suburban London. And she used to tell me that, you know, she, in her wonderful voice, you know, that the 20s and 30s were a wonderful time to be a woman. And then it's as if we fell asleep. Uh, and, and I'm always guided by that, that this was really actually a really interesting time to be a woman, all of a sudden things are opening up. And I think Lauren does an amazing job in this book of showing how women are sort of like, it's almost like you're sort of testing the ground, literally, you know, there's so much mud in this book, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, testing the ground under their feet, figuring out that, hey, we can do these things. This is not, you know, beyond the scope of what we're doing. Uh, there's this uh, wonderful moment where this reporter, uh, and, and Lauren, I'm not sure if this is directly quoted from a newspaper article, but it says you could it tell actually, they're yeah. American because of their quick muscular movements and the girls yes. are- is that really? Oh my God! I stole that. That was that was a real newspaper article that I stole and used. That was wow. the actually what wrote home that you could tell that they this reporter from it was a Boston paper. I'm forgetting the name of the exact real paper. Wrote home that you could tell that they were Americans from their quick muscular movements. Love How it. How funny is that? And there were a bunch of one-liners referring to that, I think, after that between the members. And because it's, I, so it sticks in my head, but that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but it's one of these funny things where that they were very aware of all of this, that um, part of their founder's vision for them was not just that they would save the lives of French villagers by providing them with sustenance and shelter, but that they were also there to show the world what the American college woman could do, you know, no, no pressure there. That the mm -hmm. idea was that if they succeeded in this, this would prove to the world that women could do anything. But if they failed, it was going to set back women's rights by another decade. And you know, in the background of this too is people were voting on the vote for women. Mm -hmm. um, while the Smithies are in the Psalm, they get the word that the vote for women passed in New York. And there was this wonderful letter home where, where you know this woman wrote home that she and the other New Yorkers were crowing it over all the other women from other states who didn't have the vote yet. But they were very aware that you know, their actions, their failure or success could impact things like whether women got the vote in states back in the US. Mm -hmm. And so there was a very high price for failure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is Women's History Month, March being Women's History Month this, right. uh, this and every year, I guess, since it started. But obviously it's interesting to read about women finding agency is the buzzword of the moment. Um, you know, um, and I think you certainly do a wonderful job of showing that how um, a group of girls who might not have really been tested in that sense managed to find it while they were over there. And Charles Todd writes a really good series about Bess, who is, um, as you know, um, a driver, a nurse, and whatever during World War I. And, and even Maisie Dobbs, Jackie Winspear's character, was a driver. In, in World War I and then had to find a place afterward. And you know, one of the things that um, has been true of both world wars is what did women do when the men came home? Yeah. Certainly true in Britain. And then, you know, if you carry that on after Vietnam, it was sort of like, what did the men do when they came home? Uh, and certainly true in your Napoleonic era that you were writing about with the Pink Carnation, there was nobody knew what to do with the veterans and the wounded. That, um, that came back from the war. So I think that's, um, that's something you always have to think about is we rise to heroism when heroism is required, but then what do we do in the aftermath? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you know, that was definitely, you know, this was something I read up about a lot when I was researching all the ways we said goodbye and also a previous book I wound up not writing that you know this was a big issue for French women in particular because during the war and this was something that was echoed in the Smithies letters where they commented that all of these jobs were being filled by women the street sweepers were women um, all of these jobs that would normally have been occupied by men were occupied by women I remember you know reading up on this basically about how the French government was like okay all the men are at the front women you can take the men's jobs but you have to look feminine doing it mm -hmm. and they designed the factory uniforms that they figured you know wouldn't get caught in the machines but still looked feminine because it was very important well, that it's they has you know, it's France. Yeah. This was a uniquely yeah. French problem, which may be why, you know, the Americans <laughs> look so muscular in comparison. But, but one thing also, though, that fascinated me about the Smithies, and I think says something about our own assumptions about the era, was that 
a lot of these were professional women in their own right already when they went out. The founder was actually, I mean, think Amelia Peabody. She was a groundbreaking archeologist who had already broken barriers for women and made records in her chosen field by excavating Crete. Um, but they also had a female, they had uh, two female doctors, um, both of, you know, again, both of whom were women. And in real life, one of whom was a smithy. In my book, I make both of them smithies. Everyone was, a, in real life, everyone was a smithy except their junior doctor who wasn't. In my book, everyone is a smithy. But anyway, sorry, digression. But so you had doctors, um, they had an, what they called an agriculturalist who was supposed to be dealing with all their livestock and stuff. And she was employed by the Department of Agriculture in DC. I mean, here's a woman who is an agricultural specialist who is working in DC at the Department of Agriculture. And to me, that seemed so incongruous when I first read it, but this is, as B was saying, an era when women had been beginning to enter all sorts of professions. It wasn't taken for granted, they had to fight for it, but they were there. And so in some ways, the unit was a natural continuum of that. And the other women, the women who weren't professionals of that sort, a lot of them had teaching experience or social work experience because that was something that upper middle class women did that was considered socially acceptable because it was charity, but it was also real and grueling work that, you know, that almost all the Smithies had some kind of background in social work because that was part of the sort of the spirit of the times. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna call Patrick up from the Brainy Deep um, and see if we have Facebook questions and comments and then we can come back to conversation among the four of us when he's done. Caliban here. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, there are a lot, quite a few really interesting questions that are coming through. Um, let's see. Some interesting names, too. Uh, Aspasia says, hello from the New York Public Library. Hi, Aspasia. Kind of cool. <laughs> um, and some, a number of questions are coming in just about uh, the collaborative process that you, that you all three of you have. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of that, can you just talk about how the three of you first met and where did the idea come for that first collabor collaboration? Oh, oh gosh, wow. do we, we have, have three more hours? <laughs> yeah, short form version of this yeah, story. It's a short, short form. Case bar. <laughs> I think yeah. as all good writer stories do. Uh, you know, it was the summer my first book was out. So, you know, a lot of disillusionment there about, uh, <laughs> you know, my shiny new book, which, uh, you know, I think every, every writer goes through. Uh, and so we were commiserating in a bar and, and we had already met and loved each other's work and had a, just, we'd already sensed this great bond. We just seemed to kind of be on the same wavelength, which we now call the unibrain, right. <laughs> which is, mm -hmm. we just mm -hmm. seemed to have the same thoughts. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we kind of looked at each other through that red wine fueled haze and, and said, we espresso great. martini we're to work together. And, and, th and through the sheep puns there, for some reason, we just fell in love with the idea of sheep puns and that really connected us. I think sheep are still very important to us and appear in every, in every book. Um, but yeah, so we, um, well, I mean, the real impetus was we decided we were having so much fun drinking together that night that in our boozy brains, we decided that we, if we write a book together, our publisher will have to tour us together and pay for our girls trip and our bar bill. And we thought this was the most brilliant idea ever. And we roll out into the hallway where we bump fortuitously into Karen's editor. And we announce our brilliant idea to her thinking that she's gonna get out the pen and sign us up right away. And instead she adopted that kindergarten teacher voice and said to us, okay, why don't you go upstairs, have a glass of water, take a few aspirin, you'll feel better in the morning. And we, we were so offended. But when we woke up in the morning with our heads throbbing, we realized we might not have given the best account of our brilliant idea to her. So we got was, our, our elevator pitch was not yet yeah. properly honed. But, you know, the idea stuck in our heads and, and we were all kind of busy with our own projects. But I, you know, I was, I think it was actually in, it was, a, I remember it was some kind of like a March-like day, even if it wasn't actually March. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just so gloomy and wintry and depressing. And I was revisiting this idea of going on book tour with these two dear friends. Uh, and, uh was I texting with one? I think it was texting, texting. with Karen. And yes. Karen, I did have this idea for, you know, a book that takes place in like New York City and it's in this apartment building. 
uh, with like three different generations of women and they're all connected by a central mystery. And just like the light went on, I think in my head and I, you know, forced it on in your heads as well. And <laughs> Before we know it, we were gathering together at this wonderful Alice's Tea, uh, Alice's Tea Cup uh, in uh, New York City and kind of plotting out our first novel. So that's, I don't know, we have a much longer version of that story. Much longer. There's so much more to it, her. but that's it in yeah. a nutshell. And, and we've never looked back. No, no. <laughs> And I think that's when the unibrain was launched, not intentionally. And like I, I, um, I was speaking to one of you recently about, um, you know, how this all happened, and like it, it was, it was such an unplanned thing. Like, let's write a book together. Let's let's meet together. Let's let's plan this book. Let's oh my gosh, let's write that we wrote the book. Let's sell the book. We sold the book. We went on. It was like it was meant to happen. And when we started brainstorming that first plot and writing the outline, it was magic. I, and, magic. and something that I can't imagine with any other two authors, except for these two, it really is the unibrain. Um, although sometimes I refer to it, Never mind. Okay, so the unibrain, <laughs> which is one brain and three bodies. And I've gotten that mixed up before, but that's basically us. And it's a little frightening, but it's such a wonderful, wonderful, um, experience. And I just, I, I couldn't imagine my writing career, my personal life without these two. So yeah, this was okay. definitely not a girl band kind of thing where the publisher, put, this was at no point in this process. Did we ever have a plan in place for, you know, world literary domination? It was just like, <laughs> okay, we sat, we would sit down at the table the first time to plot out the first book. And it was like, what do we do? All right, let's just do this, you know? And, and, and it was just, from the moment we began, it was very definite, you know, I think collaborative is truly the word. Mm -hmm. We checked so first the we, at the door. First, first we collaborated on picking scones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First we were like, okay, we need to order scones and quality cream and several pots of tea. And then mm -hmm. by the time we got that out the way we were primed and ready to go. Right. But I think right. what really was so We have the same taste in food and drink. I think yes. that really is. Yeah. Furthered the it sounds There's like no it sounds like awkward it's awkward moments about health food versus you know no, food no. Food. no. <laughs> it sounds like it's it's it really is sort of a pure creative process in a way yes, um, for, for each book Fun. for each book does one of you come forth with the idea or does it really vary book to book you know, it's, it's really the like unibrain yeah. yeah I mean we really could not put our finger on who did what for any given book because we build off each other. And that's the weirdest thing is one person will say, I have this fragment of an idea. And then the next person will say, oh my God, here's what we can do with it. And then it just builds and builds and builds. And there you you, you can't find the joins in it anymore. It's right. one complete thing. You can't say this is the Beatrice bit or the Karen bit or the Lauren bit. It's mm -hmm. just the us, mm -hmm. the unibrain. Yeah. So for the, just right. for the technical technical details that there are people that are interested in that. And I, I'm sure you've answered this a million times, but how do you divide up the, the, uh, the duties? Who does well, what? I, I, I would like to dispel a rumor I have heard that Beatrice <laughs> writes the whole rumors. thing. Yeah, no, my favorite quote was the, it's okay, you can tell me. I know Beatrice really writes the whole thing and you and Karen just provide Spare time. expertise. Expertise. I'm yeah. like, what kind of expertise? Not driving, clearly. Um, but no, that I would like to say that is categorically false. <laughs> we all write together. Right. Yeah. Well, we, we it's collaborative in terms of, you know, we 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 meet. Well, this for the book we're working on now, it, it was by, virtually, but we try to get together. We plot the outline together. One of us types it out. Um, and then, so we're all working from the same outline. Then we go to our respective homes in different parts of the country. And the first person starts with the first chapter, then emails it to the next person. And that's how it goes until we get to the end. And then we meet, we go over it one more time. We send it to our editor and then go drinking. And it's it's that is basically the process. It's we don't pick our characters until we're done outlining um, because these are our characters, our story. And um, and we also obviously because we write in a collaborative fa fashion, we obviously like taking um, not taking risks, but stepping outside our comfort zone. So usually we pick characters that aren't characters or time periods we would have normally written about in our 
own books. Um, so yes, yeah, so don't try to guess. You're not going to get it. Our editor doesn't uh, even get it. Yeah, sometimes um, we'd like yeah. to fool you by being obvious, but then sometimes we know that you think we're going to be obvious. So we won't be obvious or we'll think that, you know, you think that, you know, Karen's going to take the Southern character. You know that we're not going to give Karen the Southern character for that reason. So we won't give her this. So it kind of goes in a long way. Maybe we will. I mean, it's like Vecini and the Princess Bride. You just don't want to drink from any cup. <laughs> yeah, you just don't drink. Just don't try. Just enjoy. I think that's part of you know, when we first brought The Forgotten Room out, we were going to tell everybody who wrote what as part of this sort of, you know, um, marketing yeah. plan for getting people excited about it. But from the very first review, um, people were saying, gosh, this book is so seamless. You can't tell that it's three different authors. And we realized we were kind of on to something there that the seamlessness of the book, the inability of the reader to immediately pinpoint who wrote what, unless you're very, got a very good ear for literary voice and you can mm -hmm. find mine and find Lauren's and find Karen's inside the words of our characters. Uh, you know, then it's, you know, why, why sort of, you know, put the reader to that, uh, to that test, just enjoy the book. Uh, mm -hmm. enjoy the seamlessness of the story, read it as a single novel. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we always aim for when we're writing. And that being, that being said, we do like putting red herrings in. We've all read each other's books. We know each, other, each other's characters and voices really well. So mm -hmm. we will put in red herrings quite deliberately because we know that people do try to guess, including our editors. And yeah. our editors so far have consistently given all of us the wrong edits. And we're very proud of this <laughs> because it shows that we actually, we, we've been successful in adopting voices that are not entirely our own in this mm -hmm. right, you know, this try writing exercise. And mm -hmm. also that we put in good red herrings. Yeah. I was gonna ask that, is there a, uh, you said there's kind of one mind going on here. Is there is there one voice that you all kind of consciously subtly adopt your styles to? Well, I think it's, you know, we, we always have three different characters. So the characters' voices vary, as characters' voices do, even when one author is writing them. But what happens is because we write round robin, and I will be reading Beatrice and Karen's chapters every single time, right before I go into writing my own, we blend. We're all singers, you know, or we're singers at one point in our lives. And so we, we automatically adapt our voices and blend them as we write. And it also means you get continuity in terms of themes and imagery and so on. Mm -hmm. You were all singers? We've well, all done choral I mean, singing. Yeah. Not at well, any not wow. I'm seeing potential for the, uh, like the expanded cut of the digital edition. You know, maybe a, maybe a couple, put a couple of numbers at the end. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, let's get on to some of these questions. Um, Arlene has a couple of really good ones here. Um, these are for Lauren. Um, what did you learn about yourself in writing this book uh, is the first question. And um, the second question is, do you have a ritual or rituals that you use when you, when you write? Are there, do you have to have a, a silent room? Can you have music? you know those sorts of things I, okay, well, <laughs> I, I will ha 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 yeah I have to I wrote most of this book in lockdown last March when New York first went into lockdown and at the time my children were two and six and both home from school so quiet was not really an option um, my first pandemic purchases were an espresso machine. I mean, forget foods for food for the kids. We ordered that espresso machine before we did anything else and a lock for the bedroom door. So that when my husband took over the kids for two hours a day so I could write, I would lock myself in with my two shots of Nespresso. It was not necessarily quiet. The toddler did not approve of this arrangement and would tantrum outside the door shouting, mommy, mommy, why did you leave me? Or the toddler equivalent thereof. Yeah. And, but, um, so I would say, you know, my ritual is coffee. There must be caffeine next to me that I will imbibe without even realizing it while I'm writing. I, I do, I miss desperately writing at Starbucks, which is why I always used to do. It's much harder writing at home, even if you have a locked door there. But I will say that the experience of writing in lockdown was such that this book and these women and the story I was telling was so absorbing that I didn't even find it hard to write at the desk I only use usually for social media. Mm. Um, as to what I learned about myself, it was an uncanny experience writing this book during lockdown 
with, you know, there I am writing about the Smithies going through these horrific things while we're locked in the apartment with the siren sounding nonstop outside our window because New York last spring was really, really eerie. And I took great comfort in reading about what the Smith women went through. And I felt like their letters were speaking to me personally. And you know, while we were at the height of you know, despair in late March, I was writing about one of them writing, you know, I was reading a letter in which one of them wrote home, it's amazing to see how fine people are when all the normal superficial barriers are stripped away by a great emergency. And that just spoke to me on levels I can't even describe now, because this was also the time when we New Yorkers were hanging out our windows, banging pots every night at seven to thank the doctors who were going in and risking their lives every day. And people were, they were looking out for their neighbors and helping in a way that, you know, New Yorkers don't always do. And so all of this, you know, the Smithies gave me hope. And what I took away from this book was that it doesn't matter if you don't know what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you can't do something big. If you can just do something little, even if it's slightly muddled and muddle along and help as best you can, that builds up and makes a difference. And you can't say, well, because I can't, you know, I'm not going to save the world. So I won't, you know, do this, bring this one person a glass of water. You bring the glass of water. And that's what I took away from this book and, you know, what I learned writing it. Wow, what a great answer. And sorry, I don't mean to be rude by looking down here. I'm just looking at the Facebook questions and things. Um, I have a question for Beatriz, which is, um, do you have plans to continue writing the library passage on your website? Yes, I didn't write that question, but I, I agree. <laughs> I've been wondering way. too. <laughs> so um, I, so, okay. So just a quick background for those of you saying, what the heck uh, are we talking about here? Uh, and during uh, last spring, when we were all, uh, I was trying to do my bit and I, you can't really do much when you're just a writer and you're sitting at home uh, trying to take care of your family. And I, I also had a book that I was trying to finish, but I did say, well, okay, all I can do is Right, that's my only, you know, talent. Uh, so <laughs> I started writing just on my website. Uh, every week I'd add a new episode, uh, but called the Library Passage. I didn't know where exactly it was going. I thought that it might be perhaps connected to the uh, imaginative world I created in uh, my later Juliana Gray books. So it just kind of went along, and then uh, I had to finish the book that I was, you know, being <laughs> paid to turn in. Uh, and then I had to, uh, you know, do all the marketing for her last flight, which was at the beginning of July. So I had to drop it for a bit. And then I got involved in a really big project I'll be able to tell you about soon uh, over there in the fall. And then I had to get the research and get started in the book that I am, I am due to, uh, to put out and, and turn into my editor in May. So I have not forgotten about the library passage. And as soon as I get my desk clear. Uh, I will continue it. I want to find out what happens. I love these characters, even though I haven't spent very much time with them yet. But yes, I do intend to, uh, uh, to continue that story. And if now you're curious, you could just go on my website, find, go, scroll all the way down on the homepage to my blog, and, and you'll see uh, the episodes. I think there's like five episodes. I actually have gotten halfway through episode six before I had to put it aside again. So I promise there will be more. Yeah, have no fear. I will bug her until it's done, well, so. Not or just break her toes so she can't run away. Oh, yeah, like she broke mine. I'm sorry, we weren't, we weren't gonna mention that. Inside joke. Save a baby at the time, Karen, so. Yeah, what baby? Okay, sorry. Go Here's ahead. a good question for, actually for all three of you. Um, let's see, I, I can't, Pat is the name of the person who's asking this, and she says, when you approach writing a new book, do you come at it from character first, setting first or time period first? I feel like they're all so closely interwoven that the setting and the time period, of course, those are so linked and the character is so shaped by the time period that I can't really quite unpick the three from the other. I mean, for me, usually I'd say character takes a slight edge, but the character is so shaped by their time and by the situation they're in that that's an integral part of it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. And for me, because setting is, is as much a character as the actual characters are, um, my, my, I always start with my, in my head, my, my protagonist, what her internal and external 
conflicts are. And that's always related to her, to the setting, which is either this, the city or the time period or whatever. And then everything else comes from that. You know, I think ideas come from so many different places. Uh, I've had books that was, you know, one of them, you know, I was inspired to write a retelling of an opera uh, for one of mine. Sometimes it's just a snippet I see in a news story. Sometimes it's a character that appears in a previous book. And I'm like, wait a minute, I think this character is really interesting. I want to know her story. So it comes from all kinds of different places. So, you know, I, but I think that before I can actually sit down and write the book, uh, you know, so I didn't become so excited about a whatever particular thing it was about that idea that inspired you, that you forget to start to square one, which is the characters. It always begins with the characters. And if you try to write that book about that great idea without thinking through your characters first and imagining your characters and, and, and in that setting they're in, uh, you will have to rewrite that first part 80, 80 times before you get to the place where you really know your characters and you know where the story is going to go. Uh, so it, it definitely, you, you need to go through that processing. For me anyway, I need to start with a character and who this person is because everything else comes from that. If you try to, you know, force characters into a situation without knowing who they are, the book is going to be one of those books where you just don't feel like the character would really do that. You're, the character is doing something that the, the author wants the character to do, not that the character actually really would do or wants to do, so. It must be great to come across, you know, that in, in research, you know, some wonderful idea, some little nugget oh, that it. nobody's really done. It's going to be the great you idea, know? you know, so you, you can go through, you have your list of ideas. You just never know which is going to be the one that really takes root and grows. So. Or what I really love is when you have a character and you have a time period and you're researching everything you can about that time period or that instance, and then something, something specific pops up and you realize that, oh my God, this changes everything. I mean, that just mm -hmm. happened with the book I'm working on right now, which is largely set during the Spanish American War. And I mean, I knew the character. It's actually a character from Band of Sisters, but 20 years earlier. And I knew the character. I knew roughly what happens to her. But then I found this forgotten historical episode and another forgotten historical heroine. And I was like, oh, my God, this makes the whole book make sense. Mm -hmm. yep. I can't wait to hear about Question. it. Oh, you will. You will. Because I know. Well, we have a number of people asking, when's the next Team W book? Is that something that's in the works? Yes. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I've been working on the my chapter today. Um, Lauren gets it next. Um, but it is due May 15th of this year. So at some point, it needs to be finished. Um, it's been a little slower this time around. I just think because our lives are so upended. Um, and it will be out in September of 2022. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So all we don't have a title yet. All we can tell you that is it is set in Newport. Oh, sorry. Newport. Newport. <laughs> yeah. Rhode Island. Yes. Not California. Three different right, of women. And one of the one of which is the Gilded Age, because you, you can't write about Newport without writing about the Gilded Age. Although to be honest, our origin for the story actually started in the present, because we are all a little addicted to reality mansion makeovers. <laughs> and we thought, oh my God, how much fun to have a reality show about the makeover of a Newport mansion that poor, poor mansion and those poor, poor people. And that's how the whole thing started. And I think we were we were drinking at the time and laughing over the comic potentials of this idea. And then suddenly we were like, wait, this has potential to be a real book. What if we did this? And the whole process started as it always does. Yeah. Is there a little bit of gray gardens in there? Uh, <laughs> no, um, no, but I was thinking about, cause I was reading about that in one of my books and I'm thinking we need to, we need to incorporate more of the real stuff. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll see, you'll see Granite Gardens and Marble House and, um, of course the Breakers and you'll see like real, real places. And, uh, yeah. so if you're, there was, that was actually one of those moments that Lauren was describing where we're, you know, 
you know, 50 feet deep in this thing where, and suddenly I came across a little bit of Newport history and was like, oh my gosh, you guys, we have to change things around so that we involve this thing because it really kind of suddenly sets the- Oh, whole. it's going to be amazing. Oh, yeah. It's such, yeah. I, I love it. It's serendipitous, serendipitous research and I love it when it happens and it's magical. I feel like this now, is- Karen, book, Karen this what's your a- next book? I'm sorry. I was oh. just going to ask Karen when her next book is released. It's next month, um, right? April 20th. Yeah. And that is the, the last night in London. And you might recognize a character from a, a collaboration book, All the Ways We Said Goodbye. The character of Precious Dubose, who you see in that book in 1964, you get to see her because she alludes to a past in World War II. And so you get to see her in World War II in and contemporary times. Um, um, in my novel. So sort of like a reunion of old friends. Yes, she was one of the favorite characters in All the Ways We Said Goodbye. Uh, and so I think you guys, have, I love this book so much. Uh, I got to get an early copy. And uh, I think this is, Karen, you just, you're such a great storyteller in this book. It's really, I would definitely recommend it to everybody. And I paid her to say that, but thank you. Yes, and this God. also draws from Karen's own past and her youth living in this amazing historic London building, Harley House. Yes. Um, so I've been waiting. I mean, I, I haven't lived there since the late 80s, no, mid 80s. Um, but I've been dying to, I lived there for seven years and I've been dying to tell the story of this gorgeous building that was around during the Blitz and that I was completely, you know, when I moved in and the porter said, oh yeah, you'll notice that half the windows are just plain instead of leaded glass because during the Blitz they were blown out. And just since that moment, I mean, I've always loved his history, but that struck me because that was the first time I'd ever like lived. I mean, it was history you could touch. And um, I knew it, at some point I'd have to write that book and that's what this book is. So, yeah. I'll just, I'll just get a few more in here before I fade into the darkness. Um, uh, for Beatrice, how did you choose the topic for your upcoming book, Our Woman in Moscow? Uh, you know, I have, thank you. I've always uh, wanted to write about the Cold War for, you know, a number of reasons. And, uh, you know, one of them is that I think we tend to forget, uh, you know, just how deeply, uh, you know, that, you know, and it was, it was a long period of time and just how deeply it wove itself into our, you know, our, our, our cultural, you know, our fabric of our, of our lives. And, uh, you know, I, I, so I've always kind of, you know, I guess clicked on stories that had to do with it. And, 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 and I had already known about the Cambridge Five, uh, which uh, they were this group of British spies uh, and they had been recruited by the Soviet intelligence service in the 1930s uh, when capitalism was sort of uh, demonstrably on the ropes. A lot of uh, bright young people were turning to communism, thought this sounded like a great alternative. Uh, we did not then know uh, what we know now. And, uh, and so a number of these young men in, in, at Cambridge were recruited by the spy services. These Soviets very cleverly understood that uh, uh, you know, these young men at Cambridge would soon be entering all the sort of highest reaches of power and would be extremely valuable. And they actually were enormous volumes. There was literally nothing that Stalin did not know about what was going on uh, in the West at the time. All our secrets basically went straight to Stalin uh, during that period because of course the cooperation between the US and the UK, particularly during and right after the war, uh, you know, sort of all went into that. So I was fascinated by this. I was fascinated by the psychology of these men. Uh, and, and then I was also fascinated by what's going on with their families, you know, and how this double life there's this disintegration uh, that takes place uh, among so many of them and their families. And, uh, and so I really wanted to write about that. So it sort of combines this kind of spy thriller, uh, you know, narrative momentum with, with this kind of a deep psychological dive as well into personalities and also relationships. So uh, it's kind of the intersection of the personal and the political in a very deep way. And I just, I loved writing this book once I kind of figured out how I was going to combine those two elements. And uh, I can't wait for everyone to read it. It's really, uh, it'll be out June 1st. All right, I'm going to just do one more, if you don't mind. Um, and this is a good one. Um, Lydia says, uh, asks for, for Lauren, 
Um, was Smith College cooperative in helping with your research for Band of Sisters? I would assume you had access to the Smith archives. Uh, as a Smith grad, I'm so surprised I've not heard about this amazing group of Smith women before. Um, I'm sending information on, on it to my Smith Class of 1966 reunion Facebook page and to the Smith College Club of Cleveland Book Club, as I think all Smithies should read it. Absolutely. Wow, Lydia, thank you so much. And actually, if people want to know more of the real background material, there is a reader's guide on my website. If you go to under books to the Band of Sisters page, there is an 18 page reader's guide where I have pictures of the real Smith unit, maps that they sent home that they hand drew of the region, their headquarters, and even the interior of one of their barracks where one of the women was like, and here's my bed, and here's where I keep my trunk. Anyway, and recipes and um, the schedule of their day as one of them recounted, all this other stuff. Um, I am so happy to have been able to bring these forgotten heroines back to life. I feel deeply honored to have been trusted with their story. And I feel a little bit guilty that I'm not a Smithy, although I went to an all girls school for 13 years that was run by a Smithy who did her best to turn Chapin in New York into the image of Smith over her 40 years as headmistress. So I feel like I'm sort of of the lineage of Smith in a kind of you know wrong side of the blanket way. But anyway, um, Smith couldn't, despite, despite my non-Smithiness, could not have been more helpful. This book would not be here without the generosity of the librarians at Smith's Special Collections. Because as I think I mentioned before, I had found snippets of their letters, excerpted snippets in the alumni mag from 1917 and 1918. But it was very clear these were edited. There were, there were gaps, let's just say. There were things that did not make sense. And there was this comment in the memoir that I had read about the only limits to this high endeavor were the limits set by our fellowship and our own personalities as like, there's drama, what's the drama? And so I was like, I have to get my hands on the real letters. Are there real letters? And Smith has a library guide in Smith College Special Collections for the Smith unit. And you can see which of the Smith unit members have papers in the archive, but you don't really know how much exactly is in there. And so there was something on their website about digitization. And I very hopefully emailed them saying, would it be possible, you know, I have a one-year-old and a five-year-old, I can't come to the archives. Would it be possible to digitize some of this material for me? And they were like, you realize that's 2000 pages. And I was like, is it okay to just get some of it? And they were like, no, no, don't worry. We'll digitize all of it for you. And they did. Wow. They sent me thousands of, they digitize thousands of pages of material. And what really, you know, makes me teary is then they, they took some pictures of the real letters in situ. So I would see what they looked like because I couldn't get to the archives and handle them. So not only did I have the digitizations of the letters, I could see what the, what, like what they looked like, what color they were, what the ink looked like, you know, what the paper they were ran on looked like. And so How bad am, the handwriting is. Well, the handwriting I had, because what they did was they took the real letters and they basically took photographs of each and every letter. I mean, again, again, thousands of pages of letters and they photographed them and then digitized them and sent them to me. So I was, I was fighting my way through that handwriting, which they were writing with like broken pencils in the dark, in the cold, in their barracks, in the song. And I was so grateful to the one or two who had brought typewriters with them. <laughs> it's like, yes, yay. But Anyway, but I was so incredibly grateful to Smith College Special Collections because without them, this book would not have been there because there's stuff I learned in those letters that made the whole story made sense, make sense to me. But you know, you can read the book and find out. And also um, <laughs> if the Smith Club of Cleveland would like me to come and talk to them, just drop me a line, let me know. I am delighted to talk to as many Smithies as possible about their heroic forebears. Oh, and one last note before I end. So the gray court gates at Smith, those came from the Smith College Relief Unit. Their headquarters was a little town called Gray Court. And while most of the town had been destroyed, there were some very impressive gates left standing. And when, you know, after the war was over in 1924, the trustees of Smith College had an exact replica of those gates made and installed at Smith um, as a tribute to the heroism of those brave Smithies who saved so many lives. And so for everyone, every Smithy who has walked past the Great Court Gates, and that that's why the Great Court Gates are there and why they're the Great Court Gates. Wow. 
Wow. No, we really should end on that because I don't think there's any way to top that. Let me <laughs> hold up. Really, that's a gorgeous story. Let me hold up the book again and remind you that an autograph. Are those the is. gates right there on the yeah, cover? Are those are the gates. They are. Those are the yes. gates. Right there. If I hold it way up close. Yeah, then you can see it. Yeah. Any Smithy looking at that will probably have a moment of cognitive dissonance because those are the gates you walk past every day in Northampton, except they're there in front of a ruined chateau. Wow. Fantastic. You know, I just want to say, Laura, and you know, I finished this book. You know, this I, it is just such a wonderful book. And I think if, if you're somebody who loves Lauren's writing as, uh, you know, as I obviously do, you know, this book, it's, it just feels to me like the book that you were meant to write. This is like, you. Oh, you know, yes. just that you just understand so well how these women interact with each other. It's just so wonderfully portrayed in their heroism and, you know, their the mundane moments as well as the heroic moments. It's just fantastic, wonderfully paced. It's such a fantastic story. And so. we were there at the beginning when she was first talking about it, when she discovered oh, those letters. <laughs> Yeah. When we were all we're like the ants, we're the proud ants. I was like, guys, here's the source. Is this crazy and fascinating or what? But I, know, so I was literally like, dang it, I wish I noticed that before. <laughs> it's like, ha, oh, I got that one first. I know. Sometimes we do dibs when we find story ideas. We we actually do. We're like dibs, you know. So. Literally, in that word, dibs. Yeah. <laughs> Makes really good sense. It's mm -hmm. been so much fun to see you all again. Last time you were all together, we had lunch. Um, I know, and you're yeah. lovely. No. Yeah, yeah. So September of 22, we have a real shot at it. And yes, ma'am. We'll get oh, to yeah. see you in June. You can't keep us away. All right. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I'm in Connecticut where our vaccination program's going really well. So I was sort of hinting to my publicist, like, is there any way if I'm vaccinated? So I don't think any in-person stuff is really going to happen this summer, though, is, is what I was told. So um, hopefully we can figure some way to get everybody together at some point again soon. But, but by autumn 2022, when the Newport book comes out, it will be the best book tour ever, part four. Right. Yes. I think, yes. I think the publishers are leaving it up to authors. They're not actually sponsoring it, but we've already had a couple of authors coming here. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, no, and so on. we'll just have to negotiate how it all goes out, but we'll see. In any case, ladies, thank you so much. Enjoy the thank rest you. of your Bye weekend. Bye. It's been, as always, a fabulous conversation. And Patrick, Bye. thank you for hosting. Thank once you, Patrick. Again. Patrick. Bye, Lauren. Bye, Bye. Beatrice. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you, Barbara. All right. As always. Thanks, Barbara. Congratulations. Bye-bye.